Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. We have good, good, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. All of it brought to you by NetSuite by Oracle. Right now, NetSuite is offering you valuable insights with a free guide, Seven Key Strategies to Grow Your Profits. You can get that at netsuite.com slash martini. A lot more on that coming up in just a few minutes. Jim, let's get to good martini number one. We talked about this problem a lot over the past few years, and that was ESPN not spending a lot of time covering sports. But now it is, so that's great news. You wrote about this in the corner yesterday saying, does it seem you hear a little bit less about political controversies in the sports world than you did a year or two ago? Do you find yourself grumbling at your television? I just want to enjoy the game less frequently. Well, that's because a change has occurred at ESPN. The Los Angeles Times did a story on this, and they interviewed Jimmy Pitaro, the former president of Disney Interactive, who is now uh, pretty much the head of ESPN. Here's what it says. Pitaro has also satisfied ESPN's more traditional fans by steering commentators away from political discussions on air and on social media, which heightened during President Trump's criticism of NFL player protests against social injustice during the playing of the national anthem. Quote, without question, without question, our data tells us our fans do not want us to cover politics, Pitaro said. My job is to provide clarity. I really believe that some of our talent was confused on what was expected of them. If you fast forward to today, I don't believe they are confused. Uh, Jim, this goes way back before the Trump administration. I think it uh, largely happened from the early days of the Obama administration. I can distinctly remember uh, SportsCenter covering the start of WNBA games just to talk about how the warm-ups referred to Black Lives Matter, and they never even really got around to the highlights of the game from those particular events. So what do you make of ESPN realizing the obvious here that people watch them because they want to hear and see sports? You know, Greg, you really should be careful there because from the tone of your comment, you might suggest that there's less interest in the WNBA (laughs) than in other sports featuring men. We know that couldn't possibly be the case. Um, Yeah, it it was interesting because it's interesting to see this comment from ESPN's new president. who has been on the job since 2018. And kind of the anecdotal evidence. You and I had talked a little bit about the, the I'd say almost, you know, not even a, a brewing controversy, but, you know, the murmurs about Nick Bosa, uh, the Ohio State uh, defensive end and edge rusher uh, going to the San Francisco 49ers around the NFL draft. But by and large, um, it seems like the intersection of the world of politics and daily political controversies and the world of sports has kind of died down a little bit. Um, you know, actually, that, that wasn't really one of the big stories coming out of the NFL draft. The big story coming out of the NFL draft was the NFL draft. Um, and so the question was, okay, was this just a matter of NFL season ended, people, players weren't kneeling during the national anthem, and that particular controversy had died down? Um, or was it that there's been some sort of change? And, you know, this, this comment from the ESPN president indicates they've decided, okay, this doesn't work for us. Uh, he didn't say he had banned this sort of topics, but I think he said very clear that our fans do not want us to cover politics. And that certainly suggests, if he's saying things like that, that certainly, I interpret that as a statement to fans saying, hey, that thing that annoyed you, um, we're going to cut it out. It's going it's to be, you're going to hear it a little less frequently than you used to. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. You're still going to have certain players not showing up to the White House uh, for the championship ceremonies and things like that. It's not like we'll never see the intersection of politics and sports again. But I do think it's peaked, and I think, no pun intended, the ball is rolling in the other direction. Look, there were several figures who were at the heart of this, but I think a big one was Jamel Hill, uh, who was uh, at one point co-anchoring SportsCenter in the 6 p.m. time slot. There was was explicitly pitched as being more than just uh, a sports show. It was going to focus on music and pop culture and certain other topics um, that seemed a little bit unusual for a show whose name, Greg, is sports center <laughs> you kind of figure you know sports would be at the center of the project of the programming but uh the argument from the sbn was that this was the toughest hour to fill because uh the east coast games hadn't started uh and everything that had happened the day before was kind of old news so they were kind of looking for some new way to jazz it up i think you can safely say it didn't work out the way they hoped uh jamel hill has left espn now writing for the uh the atlantic magazine 
Uh, the place that found Kevin Williamson too scary and menacing, far too controversial for them to have in their pages. And, you know, her argument last time, I, just right before I checked, before I posted that yesterday, her latest argument was, why don't white athletes get how troubling uh, Trump is? So she's, she's staying on brand over there. Bob Costas has retired. Uh, he survived the pink eye and, uh, and everything else. And, you know, there was a, you know, as far as sportscasters go, pure sports, Bob Costas is one of the greatest of all time. However, once he started opining on NBC's uh, Sunday night uh, uh, football coverage and things like that, irritated a lot of fans. Um, and Olbermann is still with ESPN, but he's not, I think it's safe to say he's not the political force he used to be, not as active in it. In fact, he's kind of grumbling about Rachel Maddow. Uh, and other folks at MSNBC not appreciating him enough. So uh, you look at that thing that the tide has receded. I don't think it's gone entirely. And I don't, you know, it's like I'd say there's never a case where um, sports and politics are not, you know, should mix. But I think on the on the day to day coverage, uh, I want my roundtable discussions on ESPN to look different from the ones on CNN or Fox News or MSNBC. And uh, so you know, good for you, ESPN. I'm not saying you can never get into these areas. Just, you know, pick and choose your areas where you want to delve into political waters and just give us the score and the down and the distance. That's all we really need. No, that's exactly right. Why would you intentionally alienate a huge swath of your audience depending upon the issue? I mean, they had people, they were showing tweets from athletes reacting to Trump's travel ban. Uh, They made a huge deal of every athlete that came out, uh, whether they were major names or not. And uh, the lefties are still there uh, in large part. Uh, they, haven't, they haven't gone anywhere, but they're actually doing the job that uh, we expect of them. And that's good because, you know, Keith Olbermann back in the 90s when he was teamed with Dan Patrick on SportsCenter, that's one of the great combinations in, in sports broadcasting history. And he didn't get into politics at all that I can remember. Maybe he had a few asides here and there. But their performance on that show was fantastic. I don't know if we'll ever get back to that level. But that's what ESPN has finally realized they need to do again. And uh, hopefully it stays that way. But we'll see. You know why this happened, uh, Jim, is because Mr. Pataro was looking at his numbers. And he didn't like what they said. And if you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. But the problem that growing businesses have that keeps them from knowing their numbers is their hodgepodge of business systems. They have one system for accounting, another for sales, another for inventory, and so on and so on. It's just a big, inefficient mess, taking up too much time and too many resources. And that hurts the bottom line. Introducing NetSuite by Oracle, the business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy-to-use cloud platform, giving you the visibility and control that you need to grow. With NetSuite, you save time, money, and unneeded headaches by managing sales, finance and accounting, orders and human resources instantly, right from your desktop or phone. That's why NetSuite is the world's number one cloud business system. And right now, NetSuite is offering you valuable insights with a free guide. It's called Seven Key Strategies to Grow Your Profits at netsuite.com slash martini. That's netsuite.com slash martini to download your free guide, Seven Key Strategies to Grow Your Profits. N-E-T-S-U-I-T-E dot com slash martini. NetSuite.com slash martini. All right, Jim, on to our second good martini now. And we've talked a lot about the abortion debate this year because we've obviously seen a lot of action, particularly at the state level. Earlier on this year, it was New York that was uh, making far more liberal uh, abortion laws, essentially allowing abortion for any reason right up to the moment that the baby hits the birth canal, or maybe even slightly after that. Then you had Ralph Northam talking about keeping infants that had been born following attempted abortions comfortable while a decision is made, which was extremely chilling. And that kind of got rubbed off the front page when Ralph Northam, uh, let's just say he had some problems with his medical school yearbook. And since then, we've had a lot of blue states heading more in the New York direction and a lot of more red-leading states heading in the direction of the heartbeat bill, essentially banning abortions with very few exceptions once a fetal heartbeat is detected. Alabama, of course, last week took it even further, basically saying that unless the life of the mother is at stake, that abortion ought to be illegal. Legal challenge is certainly coming. But here's the twist here. It's all been along party lines. The lefty states getting more liberal on abortion, more in the heartbeat bill direction from the Republicans. But There's a difference now in Louisiana. USA Today, bucking many members of his party, Louisiana Democratic Governor John Bell Edwards says he'll sign an abortion restriction bill that comes to his desk should it clear the state legislature. The heartbeat bill would restrict 
abortions after a heartbeat is detected in the fetus, which is about six weeks into a pregnancy. The bill faces one final vote in the state house. Introduced by Democratic State Senator John Milkovich, it passed the state Senate at the beginning of May, though a final vote on passage has not been scheduled. The governor told a gathering organized by the Monroe, Louisiana Chamber of Commerce May 7th that, quote, my inclination is to sign it. According to the Monroe News Star, quote, it is consistent with my unblemished pro-life record in my years as a legislator and governor. So, Jim, obviously it's a more conservative state. We've got some you know, Southern Democrats still in office uh, in Louisiana, so this isn't the type that we're seeing up in New York. But it's still an issue that they're going to get a lot of heat for, and they're still standing up. You've got a Democrat sponsoring the bill and now one ready to sign it in the governor's office. So it's worth noting that John Bell Edwards, a Democratic governor of Louisiana, follows what longtime listeners will know, I believe, is the greatest governor in all of human history, never mind American history, Bobby Jindal. Um, but it's worth, you know, like for perspective, if those who think I'm a little too effusive in my praise of uh, former Governor Bobby Jindal, you know, back in 2011, uh, the Louisiana Democratic Party could not find a candidate to run against. Uh, Bobby Jindal could even find some obscure state legislator who wanted to build name ID for a future bid. Uh, and this was in a state that was not considered reliably Republican very long. So I was like, okay, that's a, I did a big cover, uh, big you know, lengthy profile of Jindal for the magazine. And Republicans were feeling pretty good about their odds of you know turning the state red and keeping it red for a very long time. And then David Vitter, the former senator with whose name showed up in a Adams uh, little black book, was the one who won the nomination. This created a great deal of rift in the party, and John Bell Edwards won. And the question, you know, a lot of Louisiana Republicans were kind of grumbling. Bell Edwards had, you know, posed as a moderate, posed as a centrist. He wasn't really that centrist. And, you know, that this was a fluke, and, you know, we'll get this guy next time. Well, here we are, close to four years later. And Edwards is, you know, I, I think there's, you know, you could argue he's not certainly not been as far left as the rest of his party. Um, but now this is where the rubber meets the road. And I think this is kind of a win-win for pro-life pro Republicans. Um, if John Bell Edwards does sign this law, first of all, this will undoubtedly split the Democratic Party in Louisiana, uh, infuriate them. I think this is a possibility that some folks might stay home. Um, the other kind of destroys the narrative. I mean, if you're talking about, you know, every life governor being some sort of crazed religious theocrat, you know, determined to oppress women, well, then this certainly makes it tough for the Democrats to support John Bell Edwards. Uh, and then finally, if Bell Edwards does reverse himself and say, oh, on second thought, I can't support this legislation, uh, he hands the Republican nominee against him a very easy issue to hit him over the head with. So uh, sort of a win-win. I, I, if Edwards does go through with this, um, I will say, out of boy, and I got to tell you, uh, Greg, I don't know about you, I find it really, really hard to, to say out of boy to anybody <laughs> whose first name is John and whose last name is Edwards. <laughs> Yes, yes. There are two Americas, Jim. And, <laughs> Thankfully, uh, there are also two John Edwards. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> In one America, John Edwards ran for president twice in the 2000s and then uh, evaporated in disgrace, at least from the public stage. John Bell Edwards uh, is doing uh, a much better job as, as governor of Louisiana. Not than Bobby Jindal, but... Uh, yeah. Let's also keep in mind, better than John Edwards, the senator. That's not the highest part of <laughs> Yes, exactly. And he might be bucking the trend. My One of my favorite statistics I saw, is either in Time or Newsweek, late in the 90s, um, was that uh, there was a Republican governor down there named Mike Foster at the time, and he was term limited. He was about to leave office. And the factoid was that he was one of only two or three governors of Louisiana in the 20th century who had not been indicted. And so uh, ah. it's quite a, quite a track record, and it looks like Mr. Edwards is uh, headed in that direction as well. We'll see. Illinois governors said, hey, that's, that's, that's not easy. <laughs> that's right. Illinois has picked up the slack where Louisiana left off, let me tell you. All right, let's move on to our crazy martini now, Jim. And as we start this, I want to tell my wife to hit pause if the kids are around because I'm about to use a word that we tell them not to use a lot, poop. So here we go. Ah. My kids are four and six. All right, San Francisco ah. Chronicle reports that the city has spent more than $70 million cleaning feces and drug paraphernalia from streets and sidewalks this fiscal year, but it's nowhere near what is needed to make San Francisco streets safe for pedestrians. The city says crews are operating constantly to try to get the quote-unquote poop problem that plagues San Francisco's streets under control. But even as the city finds new and innovative ways for residents to report and avoid piles of feces on public sidewalks, the poop problem keeps growing. This is from the Daily Wire, by the way. The Daily Wire's Hank Berrien reported 
that uh, a poop map of San Francisco's dirty deposits shows a city under siege from feces. The interactive map of the San Francisco area shows all 118,352 incidents of public feces since 2011 and demonstrates the sharp increase in those sorts of incidents that San Francisco has suffered over the last eight years. But here's a weird twist. Now the Chronicle reports San Francisco is facing a unique development in the feces problem. Homelessness appears to be abating, and the tent cities responsible for most of the filth seem to be thinning out thanks to new city efforts at housing at-risk populations in public buildings. Tent camps have shrunk by at least 10 percent. The change has had some effect on how much drug paraphernalia, especially used in discarded needles, can be found on San Francisco's sidewalks, but it has had no effect whatsoever on the feces problem. In fact, the Chronicle says the poop issue has only gotten worse. So, Jim, they claim they need another $12 million on top of the $70 million to really get the problem under control. So the democratic Shangri-La of San Francisco is not uh, exactly what we'd like it to be right now. Yeah, so because it's the crazy martini, uh, Greg, I'm going to take a might seem like a crazy approach to this issue for people who are used to our particular tone when it comes to San Francisco. San Franciscans, I come to praise you, not to bury you in poop, which is what you seem to be doing, <laughs> burying yourselves. Uh, you know, do you notice that, like, I mean, first of all, it's always been this tone of, ah, San Francisco liberals. It's always been kind of a sneer in, in Republican or conservative circles. I think it's been a long time since I've been to San Francisco. Uh, probably was during, might have been back in the 90s. It was, it was back when uh, Sosa and McGuire were doing their big home run. Rip, which I think it was 98. 98, was 98 or 99. Yep. It was a beautiful city. It, it still has the potential to be a beautiful city. The, the Golden Gate Bridge, the, the painted ladies of the houses, the you know, Coat Tower, the parks. It's a, you know, there's a reason people loved it. There's a reason people flocked to it. It has every, you know, some people might argue at one point it was one of the most beautiful cities in America. It's very hard to argue that you're one of the most beautiful cities in America when there's poop everywhere. And I saw that map that you talked about in that article. It was put. It was just a matter of uh, of you know data visualization, taking the geolocation of every single report of poop in the streets and laying it over a map of the city. And at the end of it, it basically looked like the poop emoji <laughs> with the happy face and eyes that we're used to seeing covering the entire peninsula of San Francisco. It was appalling, and I'm kind of marveling at this, Greg, because you think about it, you know, figuring out where people poop is usually the first thing people figure out in human civilization, <laughs> right? Well, or nomadic tribes don't have the issue of, oh, wait, people are pooping everywhere. Usually they pick a, campgrounds. You pick a spot. There's the outhouse. There's the, the port john There's that corner over there. Do it over there so it's not over by the rest of our stuff. It's absolutely stunning that they have this problem. This should be the most humiliated city in America. Um, and if this is the the epitome of progressivism, if this is the epitome of what, you know, the, the vision of the left has, I, I could put in a ton of jokes about how it stinks. Look, San Francisco, I know you don't want to be here, right? So, I mean, you, you were talking about, like, the types of thing, you know, you know that old saying, uh, you know, government is just the words for things we choose to do together. Here's something you can choose to do together. Get the poop off the streets. And beyond that, stop pooping on the streets, <laughs> If you have to put up porta johns, do it. If you need to have stores with slightly less restrictive public restrooms, do it. If you need to, to have stores have slightly less restrictive, you know, uh, bathrooms are for customers only or something like that, do that because nobody wants to step in poop. This is really not the sort of conversation that a great city should have to have, Greg. Yeah, most communities have pretty much uh, laid the smack down on pet owners. I'm not exactly sure how you. Uh... Do that uh, to people, but uh, it should be common knowledge. So uh, if it's a facilities issue, deal with that. But now they claim they need $82 million a year just to clean the feces off the streets. So I'm, I'm guessing there should be a better place that that money could be spent. But it can't be because this keeps happening. So, Jim, hopefully that's – well, actually, I kind of hope it is the uh, a forecast for how the 49er season is going to go. But uh, <laughs> we'll see. I would say down the drain, but apparently nobody's putting it down the drain anymore. <laughs> Jim, on that note, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. We were very restrained in that segment. I'm proud of us. Ooh. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And be sure to visit our good friends over at NetSuite by Oracle, where you can get that free guide, Seven Key Strategies to Grow Your Profits. NetSuite.com slash martini. And tune in again Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.